Welcome back, Shalners. Are you ready to rock? Rah! I'm trying to be hardcore because today we're getting back to Retro Bay Week where we talk about a throwback couple and how the lessons of that relationship are still relevant today and what we can learn. And today it's Tommy Lee and Pamela Anderson. These two were like flint and gasoline. Is that, do those two? I don't know science. I'm sorry. Like they were like paper and oil. It's like, what? So they were a really volatile, combustible couple in the 90s. And I mean, into the 2000s, into like 2010, this bullshit went on. Married, unmarried, remarried, back together, tattoos, more kids, blah, 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 blah. A million arrests in between. And there's so much to learn because I mean, there's just so much. So we're gonna get into Retro Bay Week. We're gonna break down their relationship and what we can get out of it. But first, just wanna remind you, if you have a love question, find me on my website at shallonlester.com and click Get Help. You can also take a quiz to see what kind of message your social media is sending. Very helpful. And you can shop some of my merch, get some really fun hoodies and backpacks and vision boards and stuff like that. Also, be sure to follow me on Instagram at shallonxo for some daily inspiration and where I let you guys vote on the next video topic. So Pam and Tommy, I need to just give you like a solid foundation of how much I love Molly Crew. Like I love them. And I feel like I was born just like a little too late. Well, I guess a lot too late, like almost an entire generation too late because had I been like of that age, like when they were popular, I would have been such a groupie. I mean, I already kind of like have that in me to like be like obsessed, like an obsessive fangirl over like boy band, like, you know, like I loved Fall Out Boy, I love My Chemical Romance, stuff like that. And oh my God, forget about it. Motley Crue, like Vince Neil was like, I remember looking at pictures of him, like they were already over, but I was a kid and I was like, are you a boy or are you a girl? Either way, I want to put my mouth on you. It's like, I just want to be, I just want to be near you. Like do my hair, hold my hand. I don't know. I'm so confused. It's like the genesis of my bisexuality, Vince Neil. And if you've seen the movie, The Dirt, it's like a biopic on Motley Crue. It's on Netflix. I watched it three times in a row at first. Like it ended, you boop. I just started it right over again. And then I did that again. And then while I was watching, I downloaded the book that it was based on, The Dirt, which is like, kind of an exhaustive history of the band told from every single one of their points of view, which is really interesting. Like they each like wrote chapters and everything. And I was never like super into Tommy Lee. I was like, he seems like a, like a big silly dog, you know, just like, oh, oh, just kind of like flopping around and like, yeah, is that something shiny? Is there something shiny over there? Oh my God, let's rock. And, and a lot of drummers are like that. They're just full of that frenetic energy that makes them so good at what they do. And they, their mind kind of like splits into multiple categories. Do you know how hard it is to play an instrument and sing at the same time? Insane, forget about it. I try to play the guitar, it's almost impossible, almost impossible. So he is a high functioning person for sure. Like anyone in a successful band is not a dummy at all. And there's a huge correlation between people who are good at music and who are good at math. And to me, someone who's good at math is like a super person. I'm not. I can't even tell you what Flint and Gasoline would do together <laughs> or a rock. I don't know. See, I can tell a story about it, but I can't. I don't know it. So I have a lot of respect for musicians and I have a lot of respect for Tommy Lee. And in the book, The Dirt, more so than in the movie, <clears throat> it really goes into his background as a person. But we're going to we're going to get into that in a minute first we're gonna go over the nuts and bolts of his relationship with Pam Anderson as outlined by my fantastic content coordinator, Marissa. Thank you. She's like my own personal Wikipedia. And she does like bullet points on couples. Cause I mean, I know so much about so many modern celebrities, just like it's stored in my cortex, pathetically, but old school couples, like I don't. So Tommy, we kind of know Tommy in terms of Pamela Anderson. Cause that's sort of when we were like, at least for me, I was like conscious of these people. You know, I was still really young, but I was like, oh yeah, he's a celebrity, that's his wife. But before that, in the 80s, he was married to Heather Locklear. And she was like kind of the Pamela Anderson of like 1986 and stuff. Like she was a TV star. She was kind of like a Farrah Fawcett. I mean, she was it, honey. She was the Jennifer Aniston. And Tommy met her at a party and like kind of love bombed her. We're gonna get into this because I probably should have said this up front. The theme of this video is how to deal with an obsessive, intense man. Okay? 
How do we deal with a relationship that is so, so over the top? How do we insulate ourselves from people like this? And if we do find ourselves involved, how do we keep healthy boundaries? We'll break it down. So he was with Heather at the time, and this is the time when Motley Crue was really exploding, and all the conservative people are like, they're devil worshipers. That's like all people could say because they didn't like the music and they didn't like leather pants. They're like, the devil, penises, I don't know, cocaine. Oh, yeah. You know, all those things are pretty fun. So, but Heather said something that was very, very telling and insightful into Tommy's personality. She said, Tommy doesn't worship the devil. He worships me. <sighs> Man, ain't that say it all, right? I believe Tommy Lee has borderline personality disorder. And look, I'm not a doctor. I'm an asshole on YouTube, whatever. And I don't know Tommy. And I don't know anyone who does know him. But based on on the trajectory of his relationships, what he has said about his own family members and his own feelings, this is what it kind of adds up to. But we'll get there in a second. We're just gonna go over the basics. So fast forward to New Year's Eve, 1994. Tommy sees Pamela Anderson in a club and he's trying to get her attention even though he's like whacked out on ecstasy and drinking. And he's like finally getting closer to talking to her. It's like, come have a drink at our table. And she's like, I have to leave. My friends are bored. And he gives one of the greatest quotes in the world. He said, her friends were tired and wanted to go home. In all my years of experience, I have yet to devise a way of separating a woman I want from her fucking friends who are bored because they aren't getting any attention. We could do a whole video on this, on how your salty, unattractive friends are ruining your love life because they don't have one of their own. Do you want a video on this? I will. Just... Tell me in the comments, I will. So he managed to get her number and he like called her relentlessly for six weeks and she was like, mm. like he didn't have a great reputation. He divorced Heather Lockler because he was cheating constantly. He's a rock star. He was like getting his DS every single night after a show, banging strippers, banging groupies. Like, and this is when they were like still engaged. Like <laughs> it's not even like they, they got married and they were so over it already. So Pam was like, uh. Pam was actually, so she came from Canada. She was discovered um, like on the Jumbotron at a, I think a hockey game and like a beer scout, like the Labatt's Blue Beer Scout was like, oh, that girl's hot. Let's make her like a spokes girl, like a beer girl. And her career just like took off. It's crazy. So he spent six weeks calling her. Eventually they made plans to meet up, but then Pam flaked and she's like, oh, I have to go to Cancun for work, like a photo shoot. And Tommy's like, okay, gas up the jet. His ass stalked her to Cancun, met her there, and she's like, what the F are you doing here? She was so creeped out, but her friend's like, yeah, Pam, give him a chance. This is a whole separate video too. When your friends is, there, when their bad judgment is ruining your love life, because it costs nothing for your friends in terms of their own consequences to be like, yeah, give that weird guy a chance. Michael Jackson eating popcorn gif, like, <laughs> That shit don't mean shit to them, you know? So people are always gonna encourage you to take the big risk because it's entertaining and that's human nature. We love a show. Even though we love our friend and even though we want what's best for them, I remember like one of my most traumatic experiences with a guy was when I was 13 and my best friend at the time, like eighth grade, almost forced me to ask this dude to dance at, at a dance, Andy Kratz. That's his name, that's your name, bitch. And he responded with, I don't dance with dogs. Okay, and like she was pushing me to do something risky with absolutely no fallout of her own. But I digress, not that I still think about it. So her friend's like, give him a chance. Well, she did to say the least because four days later, they got married, married, four days. And they didn't just get married. They got married with tattoos instead of rings. A tattooed wedding band is the tackiest, trashiest thing on planet Earth. Don't fight me on it. You know that it's true deep in your heart. It might as well, you might as well just turn yourself into like a human version of NASCAR because when I see that, that's what I think. So then on their honeymoon, I think they were in like Lake Havasu or something, they filmed their notorious sex tape, you know, that would be stolen because you could steal like an actual video cassette at the time. You were not like hacking a cloud and it was distributed to the public. He has an absolutely enormous penis, absolutely enormous. I saw it and I was like, that's, that's not real. I literally thought that, I was like, what is that? But what is that though? Cause that's not what that, what? It's like an elephant <laughs> Horrifying, it's horrifying. She's not a big person. Where does it go? I don't know. 
But this tall, skinny dudes are like that. Like these like lumberjack dudes with a beard. I see you. I see you, shrimp gang. That beard is covering a multitude of sins. Go for the tall, skinny guys. So they went on to have two sons, Brandon in 96, Dylan in 97, which is wild that like now Dylan is on the hills. Like he, Pamela Anderson could be a grandma. That's crazy. And this is where things went left with them. And Tommy talks about this extensively in the book that like he was obsessed with Pam. He just want to like spend time with her and like be around her all the time. And then she had a baby and then her parents came to visit and kind of never left because new moms need help. And she was like stressed about breastfeeding and is, is the baby getting enough this and blah, blah, blah. And she was just like, baby, 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 baby. And Tommy fell victim, but wait, 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 he's not the victim, fell perpetrator, shall we say, to something that so, happens to women. Guys can't understand that you can be sexy and maternal at the same time. And consciously or not, as much as he thought he knew her and thought he loved all sides of her, he viewed her as a sex pot his sex pot, his little sex toy. And so when she went and totally reoriented herself as a mother and like didn't want to be touched, didn't want to be jostled and boned after like dealing with a baby and having breastfeeding, like get away from these. He was like, wait a minute. It's a very, very common thing that men get jealous of their children, especially their sons. This is why babies look like their father biologically because men are hardwired to kind of like hate their children and it's like ah i actually don't want to take care of this thing they're also hardwired to be like is this mine are we sure this is mine and the mom's like yeah look at it it looks like you you hideous old man doesn't look like me yet that's why babies have to look like the dad to force the dad to bond with it because it's in their nature to pull away and be like but i'm not getting enough attention now so from there, things only got worse. Then began the physical abuse. Now, I haven't read any books by Pamela Anderson. I haven't really explored her side of the story. I've only explored Tommy, Tommy's. And it sounded like they just had a really volatile relationship in a, a kind of a, a codependent, a mutual way. I think they both hit each other. I think they were both violent and crazy with each other. And I definitely believe he got out of pocket. And like men don't understand what it's like to be a woman. I remember Max saying to me one time that there's no way any man could rape me because I'm so strong. I was like, well, one did once upon a time. So, and I was in army ROTC then. So as strong as you think I might be, I'm not. I'm not assault proof. I'm not beat up proof. A 13 year old boy could put me in the fucking hospital. Like he could. And men, it's like, it took so long for Max to like get that. Like he, he genuinely, he's like, but, but you're just so capable. I was like, it, I'm capable like balancing my checkbook. Not like, not a fucking SAS agent. Like, what are you talking? I'm not a green beret, look at me. And it's like men who have never felt vulnerable physically, they, they cannot get their mind around it. What do you, what do you mean? What do you mean I, you're frightened and you're, I'm scaring you? I'm just a big teddy bear. The key word there is big, all right? And I'm not big. Pamela Anderson's not big. Even if you are big, even if you're 400 pounds, men are gonna be stronger than you. So, reading his account of this abuse and and you know that volatility in their relationship it's like he didn't appreciate how frightening men can be to women and how and therefore the entire female experience as evidenced by he couldn't see pamela as a mom and a sex pot you know as like his but also the babies this was just like too much duality for him now i said in the beginning rock stars and musicians they're, they have a lot of like cerebral intelligence, emotional intelligence. So then he went to jail for a little while. He said it was a nightmare. <clears throat> uh, like, obviously no one's like, it was fine. <laughs> and, and then he started talking a little bit more about what this dynamic meant to him. And then we're gonna get into his pathology. So this is his quote. Her therapist had given her the stupid advice of ignoring me when I was angry. Because according to the therapist, I received enough attention as a rock star. 
But what he didn't know was that I was a rock star because I needed attention. I needed it. Silence equals death. So when Pamela started giving me the silent treatment, just like my parents used to do, it only drove me further over the brink. And here we are. This was like the, the book, The Dirt, I, again, it's great. It talked a lot and the guys shared a lot about like why they were the way they were, why they were a heroin addict, why they were an alcoholic, why they cut off their baby mom, like all this stuff. It was very deep and introspective. And Tommy's pathology stems from his parents. And this is why I think he has borderline. So his mom was like a beauty queen in Greece. And the dad met her like, I don't know, he was like there for work and was like, I have to have this like 17 year old beauty queen. So he married her, brought her to America. And these two did not speak the same language. They, they got married and they didn't speak the same language. And this is before Google Translate. And this is also when Greek was still really fucking hard <laughs> to understand. It's, still, it's like not an easy language. It's not like in Spanish you can muddle through. So imagine a relationship where your parents kind of don't communicate, but they like loved each other a lot. And the mom was, she went from being a beauty queen in Greece to cleaning other people's houses. And it was a very rough road. She was extremely isolated. She literally couldn't talk to her own children. And like Tommy like never learned to speak Greek. It was a very strange dynamic. But one thing she would do and the parents would do would stop talking to, to each other, to the, to the kids, whatever, when they were in a fight and they fought a lot. How do you fight if you don't even speak the same goddamn language? But I guess like the dad would like stay too long at work or go out with his friends and the mom was home. I mean, she had nobody. She had absolutely nobody. I can't imagine. It's so strange. And so for Tommy, when he says silence equals death, like that kind of became in the book, like his sort of like life's motto. And at one point the entire band went to rehab together and that was painted on the wall of the rehab center, silence equals death. And he's like, yes, for the first time it like clicked to him, like why he couldn't handle his bandmates not talking to him or a girl not answering him. It's like, oh yeah, because my parents did this. And we've talked before about borderline personality disorder and what creates it. A lot of times we see it as a result of narcissistic parents. A narcissist has a baby and they're like obsessed with the baby because the baby is obsessed with them, you know, and they love, oh, I need it. I'm wanted. I'm, I'm the only person in their world, right? Everyone loves mommy. And then the child gets like four five, six years old and does what children are supposed to do, which is branch away. Mom, you're embarrassing me. I want to go play. Getting their own friends. And the narcissistic parent is like, Well, fine. I guess I'm just not going to talk to you at dinner. No, I don't want to hear how your day was. No. And they withhold. And that creates this hysteria in the child. And they're like, ah! and so they have, they have trouble bonding. And when you have trouble bonding with your parents, when you have an attachment issue with your parents, girl, you got it all over the fucking place. You don't have healthy friendships. You certainly don't have healthy romantic relationships because something like it, like, skid it out of control when it should have been solidifying in a healthy way. Now, I'm not sure if his parents were narcissists. I mean, who knows, maybe they were, but they did withhold. And it, so who cares what the reason was? Like they withheld crucial communication with him and that made him desperate to have that bond. And in the book, all he talks about are girls. His first love this, I'm gonna marry her, I'm fucking in love with her. Uh, no, I'm gonna marry her, I'm fucking in love with her, she's coming on the tour. Like, it was all so, so intense. Like, starting from when he was 15. Oh, I'm getting really hot. Sorry, I gotta put my hair back. My like 80s wavy hair. Hmm, I hair all over myself, how cute. So this was not new to him. And this informed all of his relationships. A healthy person doesn't fly to Mexico to meet a girl they spoke to once at a club who didn't invite them. A healthy person does not get married after four days of meeting said person. A healthy person doesn't immediately get a tattoo or perhaps ever on their body of someone. A healthy person doesn't hit them. But this is how these things manifest. Tommy couldn't express himself. He couldn't tap into like, this is an issue with my parents. This has nothing to do with Pamela Anderson. Yeah, she's hot. She's got a set of tits that I like. But I feel so like manic about having to see her, having to marry her, having to bond with her, having to have that attention when she's trying to breastfeed the baby because I didn't get the attention from my parents. And 
if you've experienced this kind of mania, which I think to some degree we all have, like borderline or not, you think like, oh, all right, I came from my parents, who fucking cares, who cares? But it does matter. Just becoming aware of that in the moment to put what my therapist calls distance between the thinker and the thought. I am the thinker. And the thought is, if he doesn't call me back, if I don't send 10 text messages, I'm gonna fucking die. I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. I have to say it, I have to do it. Blah, blah, blah. That's your like demon brain. That's your sick brain. That's your Tommy Lee brain. If you wanna give it a name to further put that distance between you and that thought, call it the Tommy Lee brain. Am I Tommy Lee? Am I wearing zebra print leggings? Well, sometimes I am, but you know what I mean. Like, I can put some distance between me and that thought because I am not Tommy Lee. And I can look at that Tommy Lee thought and be like, well, that is a suggestion. Um, stalk this guy at the conference I know he's gonna be on at uh, in Cleveland this weekend, but I'm actually not going to do that. And instead, I'm gonna sit with this impulse, the Tommy Lee impulse, and ask myself, why do I feel compelled to do this? Like, yeah, okay, could be could be the family aspect. This could this could trigger something from my childhood with like, oh, my mom didn't come to my hockey games or whatever and didn't care if I won. It's not true. But <clears throat> or, and or, and slash or, because two things can be true at once. I'm gonna ask myself, what about my life right now don't I like? Why do I gotta be Tommy Lee? Why do I gotta go to Cleveland and stalk that dude I slept with one time? Why do I gotta do that? What's happening over here that makes me wanna be over here? And if you can literally spend 30 seconds, seriously, 30 seconds, just like, <sighs> I'm gonna spend 30 seconds to a minute thinking about this, okay? And then if I still feel like I need to go get on that plane and go stalk, I will consider it, but chances are you don't need to. I have a lot of food cravings. Food is my drug of choice. Like I can give up pretty much anything else. I cannot give up like C's candy. And so when I'm like, I, I, if I don't have that piece of C's candy that's sitting in my cabinet, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna freak out. I'm gonna break my furniture. I'm like, okay, we're gonna go walk around the block. Just, just to walk around the block and we're gonna take some water with us. We're gonna drink that water. And then when we get back, if I still am blinded by this craving, okay. But first, I'm gonna put some distance between the thinker and the thought, right? The impulse and the craving and see if that helps. So that's what we can do if we're the Tommy Lee. But what if we're the Pam? And look, Pam is obviously just as nuts in, in a lot of ways. Like she, she married someone after four days, she didn't say no. But in this example, we're gonna assume that Pam is a little more normal because she actually does seem a lot more normal. Not like completely, but certainly like more stable than Tommy Lee. By the way, in this video, I did not even get into the Bobby Brown connection. So Bobby Brown was Tommy's like, ex, like they were engaged after him and Pam broke up. Or no, before he met Pam, I think, fuck. She also wrote an incredible book called Dirty Rocker Boys. Incredible, incredible. She slept with Marky Mark, she slept with Leah DiCaprio, she talks about how big their penises are. Get it, it's so good. But basically Tommy like love bombed her and then like they had a fight, they were both on meth. And then like literally she hears two days later on the news, she thought they were getting back together. They were like hooking up and everything. She thought they were getting back together and turns like he went to Cancun and married Pamela Anderson. Can you imagine? Like things are going really well. I think we're on the right track. What, what'd your Google alert say? He married my professional rival because they were, Pam and Bobby were like, they were like the two hot music video blondes. Bobby descended into drug addiction as she's very upfront about and Pamela, you know, went on to be Pamela Anderson. So that's the whole other thing. But let's say yeah you're the pam in this situation where you're confronted with a dude who is like this tidal wave boom well that's the thing what happens with the tidal wave what happens with the firework they don't last long and when they end actually a firework fizzles out <laughs> a tidal wave crashes you're like that's pretty and it's getting bigger and closer hmm could this go wrong probably not bodied what do you do when someone is love bombing you? Well, 
It's important, like I said, to put distance between the thought and the thinker because a love bomb is always gonna probably feel kinda good. Kinda being the key word because someone who's love bombing you is telling you everything you wanna hear. I can't live without you. I've never met anyone like you. I've never felt like this. This is forever. Let me tell you something and I want you to hear me. You are not special to them. You are not special to someone who's love bombing you because they're an addict, okay? And we look at an addict and we're like, do you think he has like a favorite drug dealer? No, he just needs the drugs. Doesn't matter where it comes from. And real drug addicts, it doesn't even matter what it is. A handful of oxy, some heroin, tomato, tomato. I just need relief from how I feel and I need to get from over here to over here, right? And people who do that with love and relationships are the same way. They're desperate, they're unhappy by themselves, they have self-esteem issues and attachment issues, which are like, you can work on those things. Like you can help, I don't know that you can like unring the bell completely, you can't completely unwind parental trauma, of course, but you can take, you can come a long way. You can come a very, very, very long way if you want to and if you're trying. But if you're not, if you're just going from relationship to relationship to relationship, uh, it's gonna get worse. So you gotta pause and fix that. But, but we've already talked about the Tommies. We're talking about the Pams now. Sorry, I, every time I do a video, there's like one hair that's like, ha ha, fuck you. And it like, it sticks like sort of into my eye. It's like, no, now I go here. You can't find me, ha ha, I'm here. So when you feel this tidal wave coming, yeah, it's gonna tap into all those things that you want, right? And this is how we get codependency. This is how we get these like Whitney, Bobby Brown, like cycle relationship, the Pam and the Tommy's like, I need to hear this, I need to hear this. Like he said, I became a rock star because I needed attention. Well, she became a Playboy model for the exact same reason. You know, she needed that attention too. So you have Flint and Stone, whatever makes, damn it. Should have looked that up. You have those two things, those two bad things that go well together and are combustible. Ah, science. So if you are in, in the Pam position, notice how I said it'll feel kind of good. Our intuition is absolutely infallible and we have to trust it implicitly because when something moves too fast, you're gonna be like, ah. You know that we're born with two, two innate fears, loud noises and falling. And when we're moving too fast in a relationship, it feels like falling. And why don't we like to fall? Because something bad happens at the end, right? And so when we're going too fast, you know, if you're a passenger in a car and they might only be going like 35, but you're just like, can you slow down? Can you slow down? Like it just feels suddenly like very fast. That happens emotionally in relationships too. You're just like, <sighs> I guess we gotta slow down. But society and our own desperation and maybe our friends are like, no, this is wonderful, speed it up. You gotta speed this up, girl. You're not getting any younger. Who else is asking you out? No one's gonna love you like him. So you're like, okay, press, press on the gas. But internally, you're like, there's something that feels wrong to you. And you have to listen to that. If you ever feel like a relationship is moving too fast, it is. It is. There are very few things that I will say like, bar none are true. That is true. I mean, a relationship like yes can move too slowly for sure and it stagnates because like he's not into you. And that's almost better because it's not taking over your life. It's not a love bomb, it's not a tidal wave, it's, it's receding and you're desperate trying to get it back, but that's you doing that. The love bomber is doing it to you. And at some point, you gotta, you gotta realize that you're complicit in this. Do you know what I mean? You are, yes, there's a tidal wave, but you're swimming your ass out there to meet it. And that's not healthy. So if you feel that internal like, ah, I feel like you're moving too fast. What does that feel like, actually? Because we, like we gotta break it down into real shit. It's not just like, feel it. It's like, no. It'll feel like, I'm not getting a good night's sleep. My sleep is messed up. He's in my house every night. He thrashes around. I'm staying up too late. We're drinking. We're going out too much. I really need to do my homework. I'm missing my study group. I'm missing my jazz class. I haven't seen my family in a little while. My laundry is piling up. I need to do my face masks. It's gonna feel like an erosion of your schedule, okay? And for some of us, that's what we want. There comes the codependency. There comes our own getaway car. I don't wanna be in my schedule anymore. It's boring. 
My job is boring. I feel directionless in school. I don't want to be around my family. I don't want to be in this stupid, shitty apartment in this stupid small town. So here comes that love bomber. Here comes that getaway car. And girl, you are along for the ride. And again, how do things that go too fast usually end? Not well. Wouldn't it be better if you just stopped, put some thought, I'm sorry, some distance between the thought and the thinker, the you and the Tommy Lee brain, or you and the Pam brain? I mean, like, what is this guy saving me from? What is he giving me? What is he fundamentally tapping into that I need activated? Boredom? Attention? Validation? Stimulation? Like, what is it? What is it? Because there is an it. There is an it, okay? And it's very easy to get caught up in people like this, especially when you're young, because you have nothing but it. I am bored and I am trapped in this town and I am sick of my family and I am feeling fat and I am feeling unlovable and unnoticed by guys. <laughs> I could go on, you know? Like, it's kind of bottomless. And as you get older, those it's pair down if you work on it, if you work on it. I used to think when I was younger that there would be some sort of magic age. For some reason, it was 25 when I would just like, like outgrow, wake up, one, literally wake up one morning, no longer have anxiety about my body, um, no longer feel desperate to have a guy, totally know where I wanted to take my career. Spoiler alert, that does not fucking happen. It doesn't happen at 25, probably not at 35 or 45 or 85. Everywhere you go, there you are. Unless you take the steps and do the work to fix those it's. And you don't have, and it looks so overwhelming. It's like, okay, so I'm supposed to like quit my job, cut my family off, change my major, move, blah, 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 blah. No, you just need to focus on the first one. Like whatever is looming the largest. And how do you know? How do I know? I don't even know where to start. I'm overwhelmed. Okay. Well, when you feel these love bombers come, when you feel the, the Tommy Lees and when you get bamboozled, take that 30 seconds and think in, I'm picturing this perfect paradise with him. And what is absent? What is the first thing that comes to mind that's absent in that paradise that is present in my real life? Like, I feel beautiful or I feel normal. I feel on schedule, right? That's where you start. That's where you start. I feel beautiful. Well, shall have, okay, I'm just gonna like decide that I'm beautiful. Blech. Actually, yeah. I've said this before. The secret to being a hot girl is simply deciding that you are one. It's true. It is a bluff, but your mind wants to believe that. Your mind doesn't want to think that you're ugly because you're hardwired to do what? Mate. And if you're telling yourself, I'm not mateable, your body's like, ah, then what are we doing here? I don't know. What, what's the point? You know, not that you got to go out and get pregnant. Absolutely don't do that. But you are programmed to feel good about yourself because that's going to get you out there with the species. That's going to get you mating. That's going to continue the species, right? You're not programmed to be like, oh, I'm just so emo. I better stay in my cave. No, you're meant to get out there. So if you can give your mind some like something to latch onto, it's like, all right, yes, great. We're hot. Amazing. You also need to get your ass into some therapy. Everyone involved in this scenario <laughs> needs to get involved in therapy. Whether you feel like you have a touch of the borderline, maybe not necessarily complete borderline personality disorder. I assume it's like a sort of a spectrum the way narcissism is. Um, I don't, I don't know that sociopathy and psychopathy are on a spectrum. I think especially psychopaths like you kind of are, you aren't because it's a spindle neuron issue. We've talked about that before, but it can be helped a lot with therapy because like I said, most of us feel this Tommy Lee brain at some point, And usually it's when we're young and it's like, who cares? I'm young. Okay. Well, Pam and Tommy were young too when they met and then they had two kids. And then there were multiple arrests and literally this bullshit went on between them back and forth and back and forth until 2010. She spent her hottest years dealing with this Pamela Anderson hot level. I mean, man, what a fucking waste. What a waste because I don't know that these two learned anything from it. She's like mixed up with Julian Assange. I don't even know. I don't even know. And I'm not going to do a video about it because I don't even really know who he is. And every time I look at him, he looks like sort of a sickly polar bear. I'm like, I don't want you on my channel. 
And Tommy remarried Brittany Ferlin, who's like Vine famous. Okay, guess that's a thing. And she is a banging body though, holy moly. And they seem very like intense and codependent. And she's talked a lot about her own dysfunctional family. So it's like, dude, you kind of just plugged right on back into the same socket in a way. And I think he has maybe come a long way and done a lot of therapy and, and mellowed out a little bit. But like, again, like you wasted your hot years. You wasted years that could have been like really great, just being really crazy. And on one hand, we can be like, yeah, that's rock and roll. It's also just unhappiness and it's mania. And who wants to feel that way if you can feel good? Who wants to stand in front of a tidal wave where you can stand in front of like gentle, wonderful motions of the ocean? I wanna know what you guys think about this couple. Um, also follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO. We can vote on the next video topic. We've got some more Retro Bay Week couples coming. Sorry, regular news keeps popping up, so we're, we're doing Retro Bay Week kind of here and there. But, you know, we're gonna, maybe we'll just do it like long term. We'll, as, as we think of them, we'll do more Retro Bay stuff. And if you have a question of your own, go to my website, ShallonLester.com and click Get Help. I'll talk to you soon, Challoners.